Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Today I have with me Darlene Fuchs. She is the author of Get in the Boat. It is comprised of her father's journals while he was caregiving for her mom. And we're going to be talking about caregiver guilt and how maybe not to have too much of it. So thanks for joining me, Darlene. Great to be with you, Jennifer. So why don't you start with um, how the book came to be? Because I know your dad had some serious, not maybe not serious guilt. He had guilt. Yeah. And then you could maybe tell us a little bit about yours. I'll share mine and then we'll we'll analyze and figure out how we can do better. That sounds a, like a good idea. Um, so Darlene was never um, one that thought she would ever get into writing a book. Um, I had written for um, a newspaper for about four years. I was um, on staff and that was kind of interesting, but nothing quite as personal as this. Most of it was having to do with events that were happening throughout the world. So I was uh, working in corporate world and ended up at one point in time, um, went into real estate. And during that whole time, um, I ended up uh, being kind of thrown into the caregiving role. And my father-in-law um, ended up with terminal uh, liver cancer and was with us for about a month while we took care of him. And he really got an education of what caregiving was about, except this was a one month period. And I think a lot of us think that caregiving is a couple of weeks or a month, but it goes on for years for a lot of people. From then I went into caregiving for my mother-in-law who was a, a wonderful flower that needed people around her. And she opted to go into the typical senior community down to assisted living and eventually into full care. So that was totally different. Now I was a caregiver once removed because I had to deal with the caregivers at the facility. And when she, after she passed away, I had about a year reprieve or so. And my three-year-old grandson ended up with medulloblastoma. So I was then put into a role of a three-year-old child uh, caregiving for him, but also being the caregiver to my daughter who was suffering through the loss of losing, you know, losing her son. And that was totally different. And got over that and got a phone call from my dad who was out in Illinois. Uh, we were in Illinois, was out in Connecticut. He had moved from Illinois to Connecticut with my mom. And they had decided to come back and be closer to family. And I knew there was something not right. And it kind of hit me when they arrived. My mom was not all there. She was missing words, misunderstanding, repetitive, all the typical signs of early onset dementia that I was not aware of. And that's, that's how my journey began. In the last six years of my dad taking care of my mom with me, um, he did journal every day. And before he passed away, he handed me all of his handwritten journals and said, I'd like this to be a book. And I said, okay, dad. And I learned you just better really be careful about what you promise because that took me two and a half years. <laughs> so that's, that's the synopsis of what happened. Which is, that was an excellent synopsis, but man, you've been through a lot of it. But at least you didn't have guilt for taking your dad's journals and turning them into a book. He wanted that. So that, that was at least yeah. one small reprieve. Yeah, a lot of people find that they want to tell the story, but they're really unsure of it. So yeah, I was lucky in that. Yeah. Well, it's, we're getting better at not having quite the stigma that a cognitive disease had, you know, even 10 years ago. Yeah, 10 years ago. Cause so my mom started showing signs of Alzheimer's in the mid to late 90s. And now my maternal grandmother also had mixed dementia at the time. She'd had a brain aneurysm that leaked for three mm -hmm. months. And our lovely medical system kept telling her it was just a headache. This is a woman that never had headaches. 
Mm. And, you know, they just, they kept telling her to take Tylenol or aspirin. I mean, they literally gaslit her. I don't know what finally changed, changed. But they were like, oh, (laughs) she has a brain aneurysm that's been leaking. Um, And she basically had like a 5% chance of surviving the surgery. Um, I guess they didn't factor in the absolute stubbornness that is both sides of my DNA. (laughs) And so they never discussed with my grandfather what her condition would be if she did survive. Because wherever the blood touches the brain, the brain is permanently damaged. And so she basically had um, an extreme form of vascular dementia. But what I've learned over the time of doing this show is that vascular dementia does not progress in the same way as Alzheimer's. And she ended up, or my mom ended up just like her. So my armchair diagnosis is that she had both. And my maternal great-grandmother also had dementia. So yay me. My dad yeah. did mo- most of the caregiving. Well, she, my mom started showing signs when we had our family one-hour photo lab photography studio. And the day before mom's day off, she was really good at not writing down directions, due dates, or anything useful. And this was back in the old days. You can probably relate to this a little bit when um, real estate appraisers actually had to glue photographs onto their reports. (laughs) I don't know why that makes me feel so old to say that, but that's this one particular gal. And of course, at the time, four by sixes were becoming very popular and the real estate appraisers needed the smaller size. So it was it was always just, you know, you had to plan ahead a little bit, make time to switch the paper canisters, get those things printed and put away. Well, this poor appraiser kept showing up like the day, you know, they she'd drop it off on Tuesdays. She'd come Wednesdays. Mom wouldn't be there. And I'd be like, oh, he, he, he. Oh, sorry, it's not done. <laughs> um, and that just started happening more and more frequently until I told my mom one day, I said, you know, I'm really concerned. You used to have, you know, one or two daffy moments a week. You know, we all kind of do, but you're starting to have them a couple times a day. And she looked at me and she goes, I don't want to end up like my mother. And she literally stomped her foot, turned and stomped out to the front of our shop. And I was like, well, okay, then that, that gives me a lot of options. Murder is illegal. So I don't know what she thinks I'm supposed to do. And from that point on, so this was like the early 2000s, I basically hovered and managed. If I heard her shoot in the breeze with a client, I was right there in the middle of that conversation so that I knew what was being said and et cetera. It was like, it was very stressful because I didn't want to make her feel like nannied or managed Mm -hmm. because that would have pissed her off and that wouldn't have been good. Um, But I also got tired of being embarrassed with clients. So I was relieved when when the lease was up and I knew my parents were going to retire. But I was concerned because I'm like, she needs a purpose. She needs something to do. And I didn't really know how my parents were going to get along all day at home with each other. (laughs) So my dad did 95 percent of the caregiving, refused to let me help, um, really swatted away help, which was really frustrating. So after he died. I found out I didn't know anything. (laughs) I had to learn real quick how to deal with somebody with advanced Alzheimer's. And he did not want her moved to memory care. And I had just turned 50. My daughter had just finally moved out at 25. And I was like, I have been visualizing empty nest for quite a while, many years. I'm ready for that. I'm entitled Mm -hmm. to that. (laughs) So yeah, we all get kind of thrust into caregiving. None of us take classes, plan ahead, you know, none of those intelligent things we could be doing. <laughs> no, and, and it's, you know, it's, it is, it's an, people think that they're planning for what is it going to be like when I get old? And I think a lot of us have this view of, you know, you have the white picket fence in the house when you're younger, you know, in the couple dogs like you have and a few kids or whatever it is and then you empty nest now you get to travel and enjoy the rest of retirement but you know some of us get thrown into caregiving when we're retired some at a much younger age when we still have a family that we're taking care of and for caregivers it's never really expected 
unless it, you know it's something that's in your family that's coming on slow. But even then, I think we are in denial and we don't want to go there because if we've seen it, we know how difficult it is. And if we haven't, we have no clue. Very true. Especially spoken from somebody who's been through it like, what, four times in four different yeah. varieties? And different, yeah, and totally different varieties. And each one is unique. You know, like we were talking before, you know, you can have someone with cancer that has terminally ill cancer, but they can still communicate and maybe tell you what if they're cold or they're hungry or what they would want. And yeah, are they going to get aggravated? Absolutely, because they're going through a very bad circumstance. But someone with a dementia, most cases, they get to a point where they don't even know what they're really going through. I mean, initially they do when they're very angry because they notice the changes within themselves and don't want to have to deal with it or they're embarrassed or they're sad that their children may have to take care of them, a whole host of different things. But eventually, do they really know what's going on? And mm -hmm. I can remember one time, Jennifer, I asked my dad, it's the only time that I can remember that he really got mad at me. And I looked at him one day because every so often we would be talking and my mom would come out of her stare and just make a three or four word comment that was relevant to what we were talking about. And I looked at him at one point and I said, you know, dad, no one's told us, but do you think it's a possibility that mom might really understand what we are saying, but isn't able to react to it the way that we would expect her to. And he didn't say anything, but I found out when I read his journals, that was the one time that he really was upset because he couldn't imagine that as a caregiver, he was taking care of someone and, and doing all of these different things for her that she might actually inside have been able to say something, but never get it out. And I, I guess that would be very intimidating to someone, but I don't think we really have a total clue on that. No, my mom would have just often enough make a comment like, well, my brain doesn't work so good anymore. And it'd be like, you know, if you said that to me, we'd kind of laugh it off, or maybe we'd be like, well, have you had it checked out? Well, my mom would say it'd be like, ooh, is she aware? Like, does she know? Eek. And and you didn't want to react like that because then she would react. It could trigger something unpleasant, you know, because you're making a face or whatever. But, oh, yeah, that man, that always, that always yeah. hit really hard. Yeah, my mom would do things like she'd say something and would start to giggle and she'd do one of these, like, am I, I'm cuckoo? And then we would just laugh with her and she would always have this little song. She would just sing a little bit of the refrain and she'd sing it all the time. And she'd look at us and it's like, and she, she would be like, well, I did, I, you know, I don't know. I, you know, she was trying to deal with it, I think, herself. And uh, they become very smart at covering things up. Like, do they know where they're going? But they know how to shadow you like one step back so that you think they know where they're going. Every so often I'd like make a wrong turn and yeah, she'd go right along with me. So yeah, but Did she they use crutches. They definitely learn to use crutches. Yeah, I've learned that people that like are really, really smart have more cognitive reserves. So as their disease progresses, they have more tools to kind of mask it. Yeah. And so many people who you know, or just intellectually genius types, their disease seems like it progresses really fast because they run out of reserves and all of a sudden, boom. Now you're like, what the heck? <laughs> so what kind of guilt did your dad have since we're, <laughs> well, that's, that's the topic today? <laughs> yeah, since that's the topic. You know, I've, I found, I could tell when he was going through a really bad time because I was there so much of the time. If I missed a day or two and went there and he was unshaven and maybe a little stinky or didn't hadn't changed his clothes, 
I knew it was like, okay, he's a little overwhelmed with that. But a lot of his guilt, so one of the instances that I can remember he was very guilty about, he loved to play a game of golf. And when he started getting to the point that he was really having to stay with my mom to watch and make sure everything was going well, um, people would say, Richard, why don't you go out and play a game of golf? Whether you're, you know, having a little bit of walking around the property here or you're going out on the golf course, it doesn't matter. It's good for you. And he would just have a really hard time getting to the point that he said, okay, I'm going to go out and try playing nine holes. And I can remember in the journal when he was writing that, you know, the first time he got there, he was so excited and went through the first hole, the second hole. And then he said, as it would go on, then I'm thinking, okay, is there someone that's really responsible that's taking care of Gail? Or, you know, what is it that, that she may need that they're not aware of? And I think those types of things, you start worrying that something's going to go wrong if you're not there. But what if you stepped out to just go down and get a cup of coffee? Or you're in the bathroom and taking a shower. Um, the, those things could happen anyways. And it really took time for him to realize that you have to get rid of some of that caretaker mindset if you really want to try and move back and enjoy something. And the ex otherwise, the exhaustion just gets to you. So he managed for shorter periods of time to be able to get away and know that it was okay to allow himself that freedom to not worry and go out and have a little bit of reprieve and do something that was going to be healthy for him. And I think that caregiver's guilt is, you know, we're being inconsiderate to ourselves because mm -hmm. we really do need to take care of ourselves. And I think we get to the point where we need to acknowledge that however much time it is, we need, we need to take that time in order to be a good caregiver to the person that's needing the care. And he would tell me, you know, when these thoughts would get into his mind, he said, then I would sit there and say, okay, Richard, it's time for an attitude adjustment. You know, my, my life matters. I've told everyone I need to be healthy enough to take care of Gail until she's no longer with me. And I won't be able to do that if I don't care, take care of myself. So he learned that but it took him, I think, too long to learn it because he just suffered sometimes in, especially being a man, his manlyhood or the intimacy, not knowing how, how do you deal with that with someone that is going through Alzheimer's? You know, you still want to be close to them, but a lot of times they really don't want to be close to you. And I think just looking at, of flaws and loving yourself and learning to forgive yourself when you're not perfect is the first start of that caregiver journey in just acceptance of, yeah, we all are going to go through those times where we're ready to just, just throw in the towel. I can't do it anymore. And I've been through those times, even with my mom too. And yes, I've raised my voice when I knew that you know, eye contact, so soft voice, mannerism. I knew all of those things. And still, still, you know, I would go through that and then feel bad about it afterwards, but know that I just had to put that behind me and just go forward because that's what's most important is that next moment because, you know, those past moments, they're gone. Yeah, they're gone, especially for our loved ones. Yeah, I didn't lose my cool too often with my mom, um, but there were incidences, things that would happen that when, well, one of my favorite stories is when my mom was in the first 18 months, my mom was in memory care. She had her black miniature poodle with her. Now, anytime Misty looked at my mom prior to them moving, my mom would feed her. You know, the dog might need love, might want play, just, you know, whatever. And my mom would feed her. So a, a miniature poodle should weigh about 15 pounds. Misty weighed 28. 
She was so fat, she could not do proper doggy hygiene, which we're not going to get into the dis description of that because it was gross. And she was, she was such a problem because of the hygiene issue that the executive director and the med techs and I put into place the dog. You know, there was another resident that had his two small dogs with him. They were great. They would sleep on a little doggy bed in the dining room. They didn't beg. Misty did begging for all three of them <laughs> and got food for, I don't know, half a dozen dogs. <laughs> One of the problems was the residents were like, oh, the poor doggy is so hungry. And they'd literally wrap up their half of their meal in the cloth napkins to give to the dog. And then, of course, you know, if, if the dog is not there and the cloth napkins with the meat in it gets stuck someplace, you can imagine some of the issues we were dealing with. So we made it a rule the dog was going to go in the room and the residents would have their meal. Well, nobody discussed this with Misty. <laughs> so I'm literally trying to shove a nearly 30 pound, extremely reluctant dog into my mom's room. Another resident who I affectionately referred to as the residential klepto, because anything she put her eyes on became hers. So you had to be very careful, like if I'm visiting my mom, if that woman, got a hand on my purse. I had a problem because she was, I'm only five foot two and she was shorter than me and obviously older than me. And I did not want to have to wrestle my purse away from this gal, oh. you know, taking a risk of elder abuse or you know, just like, so I was always aware of what she was doing. Well, she had decided that Misty was hers. She did not like it that I was putting Misty in the room. She was trying to get my mom to help her stop me. And she reached out and grabbed my mom's forearm. And all oh. I heard was, if you touch me one more time, I'm going to knock your block off. And I was like, oh, crap. Because my mom had literally lived there for like six months. I'm like, oh, my God, I do not need you getting thrown out. Managed to shove the dog in the room, slam the door. The shrieking and howling, I mean, ugh, would have been great for hellhounds in a horror movie. My mom, thankfully, was standing in front of the door to the courtyard. I don't even know how I managed to push her and the door at the same time. I was just like, get her away from this other gal. <sighs> and my mom was so angry. She was shaking. And I just kept repeating over and over. Oh, it's so terrible. She loves Misty so much. And her mind is so bad that she thinks Misty's hers. And oh, she loves Misty. I mean, just over and over and over. And I don't know, it felt like forever, but it must have probably been three or four minutes. My mom looks in the window and goes, well, I think it's dinner time. And I was like, oh, thank God for dementia. <laughs> I was just like, you know, because how do you explain, you know, cognitive impairment to somebody who's cognitively impaired? And of course, the dog was still no. screaming. <laughs> All we just, do is try to avert the attention and focus on something else. That, that, yep. that usually, it usually worked. But it worked we were talking, great that day. Yeah, that's good. But what we're talking about is care caregiver guilt. You know, I think some of the important things that we have, if we're, if we're kind of looking like, how do I even get past all of that? I think first, the first thing is like we were talking about is we have to acknowledge that, that we have those feelings. And I think a lot of it is um, acknowledging that it's, everybody has it. It's common. It's natural for all of us to go through that because it's not something it's just like being sad after somebody dies. I mean, we all go through that. And then we have to give ourselves acceptance and say, okay, I know that everybody has it. It's okay to feel that way. But then how do you start to get past some of that? And with my dad, journaling became a very good outlet for him. Through his journaling, he could vent. He could... Um, reflect on his relationship that he was having and and put those things down so that he could read them again i think it also gave him the ability to look at where my mom was you know how things maybe had gotten different um her progress and to be able to go back if he needed to to see six months ago what did i write in my journal how has it changed and he used to tell me at the end of the day, the most important thing is stand in front of your mirror and ask yourself, how did I do today? And if there's something that you think you could have done better, then 
do something. I'm sure it, 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 these words weren't in his mind, but set a daily intention. You know, know that when you get up in the morning, just today I will pick one thing. I'll laugh with the person I'm taking care of, or we'll share a story, or we'll do an activity or something like that. I think acknowledging and trying to, you know, Oprah used to do the, you know, write down one thing that was positive for your day. And I think we can do the same thing when it comes to caregiving. Instead of, yes, there's a lot of negative, but instead of just focusing on that, like pick out that one thing that maybe you did good or you were able to, you know, realize that you could get your loved one to take medications so, you know, kind of set that goal for yourself, that one little thing. And then if you're able to achieve the goal, you're going to feel a lot better. And I agree. I always tell people, as I'm sure you've heard, a lot of people are like, find something to be grateful for every day, which is, a, is very helpful. Um, kind of helps you shift to a more positive mindset. But I tell people, add in, and this is very similar to what you just said, add in at the end of the day something that you're proud of yourself for, something you accomplished, you know, you didn't be small. Yeah. You didn't lose your, you know, when the stuff hit the fan or you decided this to-do list is getting trashed today because my person's having a rough day or I managed to get everything done and we still had a great day, whatever it is. Yeah. It doesn't have to be huge. Mm -hmm. Just acknowledge that, you know, you managed. You know, you, you made it through another day and, and everybody's next, still breathing. Yep. And the next day could be totally different. But, you know, at least that day, you, we all have to have done something right. I mean, it, we can't be a failure at everything we've done. And I think that goes along with we have to set some kind of realistic expectations. You know, we have to know ourselves. What are what are my physical limitations? I mean, some of us have those. You're short. So am I. I mean, you have someone really tall. It's hard to manipulate a person that's a lot bigger than you. Um, even your emotions, you know, and your mental well-being at the time. I mean, we have if we don't know what our expectations are and we don't voice to other people and allow ourselves to be vulnerable, to let them know that we do have limitations, they don't know how to help us. And sometimes that means that we have to admit that we do have limitations and we all do, especially getting older. I mean, I can't do things I used to do. That's true. <laughs> yeah, like read the small print on a medicine bottle. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's, that's what these are for. <laughs> oh yeah. I have those no. all over the house. And no. then I have special ones to see the computer screen in focus. <laughs> yeah. But I'm always, in, and I'm always interested in is when we're new parents, we know we don't know stuff. We know we need to learn. Generally ask our moms, maybe our grandmas and aunties, you know, maybe another new mom. We join a mom's club. I know I did. And we don't seem to have quite the same guilt. Yes, we do when something bad happens. My daughter came running in the house when she was about 18 months old, slipped on the tile floor and managed to slide under the 1940s metal kitchen cabinets and sliced open her head, which I did not know at that point that head wounds bleed like oh, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and oh, we yeah. lived probably about 40 minutes from her pediatrician. And of course she's screaming and I had taken the, the opportunity cause she was out playing to wash her blanket and she won the blanket. So I had to give it to her wet. <laughs> and I was like, I mean, it was just, it wasn't anything I did. It just was life. And I did not, I was a little freaked out until, you know, my mom, thankfully, she still had her wits about her and said, oh yeah, head wounds bleed a lot. I was like, okay, good. So the kid's like brain isn't about to like, squeeze out of her head. She's going to bleed out. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I had not experienced that and it was just like, oh, okay. So I didn't feel like I had to rush her to the doctor or the hospital or what. I never thought about the ER. I don't know why. I guess I knew it wasn't that serious. But with my mom, it just seemed like everything seemed like a crisis, not necessarily with me. I, I was able to keep a fairly even keel, but the care staff 
whenever she had a shift in behavior, she started having, um, in, not necessarily incontinence issues, but she was having like urinary issues. And they kept telling me, oh, I think your mom has a UTI. And if, it took me like two horrific trips to the doctor to find out that she didn't have UTIs either time to learn. Okay, they just called me on Wednesday afternoon. I'm going to wait till Friday morning. If she's still, you know, having the same, then we'll go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. If it gets worse because, you know, dropping what I was doing, going and getting her, getting her to the doctor. I mean, just getting a doctor's appointment. We don't even need to discuss that. And it, but it, it always felt like I didn't want to tell people that I was waiting. I'm going to wait to see if it gets worse before I deal with this. Cause that just always seemed wrong. Mm -hmm. Even though we'd go through all of these, you know, all this minutia to get her to the doctor and then to try to get a urine sample. Holy Lord. That was always a difficulty. It was never pleasant. It was always stressful for her. And just to find out, no, she doesn't have a UTI. It's something else. It's like, okay, I, you know, it's just, ugh, it was awful. You know, it just I always felt like I had to manage everybody else's expectations. Like, of course, I'm going to drop what I'm doing and rush over and deal with this. I had the doctor's office call me once and they're like, this was because of the constant concern about UTIs. Literally, it was like 1130. I had been out with my cycling group. I came home early to get work done. So I was, I had just gotten out of the shower. The doctor's office called and they're like, well, the doctor wants you to bring your mom in. Okay. Why? Like, does he actually need mm -hmm. to physically see her? And, and if so, for what? Oh, well, they want to schedule a, um, an ultrasound. Fine. Schedule the ultrasound. And this was a, no, it was a Friday. And oh my God, it was like eight phone calls later just to get this scheduled. I had to go two towns over. So like a 20 minute drive to pick up my mom. And it was like the absolute audacity to assume I, they were, they were not happy when I said, um, you assume that I have time to do this today. Oh, you don't I'm like, no, I work. What the hell? Oh. <laughs> it was just like a shock. I'm like, and that made me mad. And then, then I'm not usually very easy to deal with. <laughs> and but, it's just, know, that's it's that's that's how usually the person that is like yourself and like I was. I have two brothers. They didn't live in the area, so I had no help from them. But there's a lot of caregivers that have family members or friends that are within a short period of time. They could be there in 10 or 15 minutes, but it's almost like the stigma of oh, Alzheimer's. You know, it's like, no, we don't have time or 199 different excuses of why they can't show up. And it, it can be very isolating at times. And, you know, you look at that and you're like, you know, so many people say, well, as a caregiver to help with the guilt and to help with the stress, you know, seek support. Well, duh, everyone needs support. I mean, that's what we all want. And, it, and caregiving is very emotional. It's physically demanding. And to just say seek support which is very crucial to caregivers um in order to just maintain their own well-being it's it it's so easy for someone just to say that so you know i always say well how where where do you get you know you start throwing that through your mind and it's like other caregivers you know usually if it, you can connect with other caregivers either through a show like yours you find out who's in your area at least then you have a sounding board. Or on social media, a lot of the platforms that are on Facebook or, you know, other ones like that, it's they're very good to at least throw a question out there to get something back. And I've found that a lot of places have like a senior community center. Some of them have support groups and some of them aren't necessarily in person, but they might be online which makes it a lot easier. And it's just being able to share our feelings and to be, to ask someone to validate them and say, yeah, that's normal. A lot of times we know the answer, but we just don't, we hear it in our head, but we don't feel it in our hearts. And for somebody else to validate it, I think makes the heart feel like, yeah, 
it's I'm I'm doing it okay, right. I I don't have to worry about that guilt. And people, other people that have faced it, like yourself, in these shows, I think gives people stories from other caregivers to be able to know that it's okay. And you know, once you know it's okay, then then you can start going out and say, okay, is there technology maybe out there that can help me with my loved ones? And I know there's there's a lot. I think there's one, you know, I don't really use any of them because that wasn't something that was available really when I was doing all of my caregiving. But I know there's stuff like CareZone and I think there's like MediSafe. Um, there's different ones like that where you can track your loved one's medications or their mood or the you know, their well-being. And I'm sure you probably have a list of them, Jennifer. People can go to your site and they can see all of those, but they really do help to be able to read something or hear something that says, I'm at the bottom right now and I don't know where to go. To have some place to go and know that it's okay and maybe have little baby steps to be able to start getting out of that bottom is very, very helpful. And this show started before sharing your loved one and your caregiving journey on social media was acceptable. And yeah. um, I, f I find I learn so much more from guests like yourself than I ever get from listening to somebody else's story on social media, because I think that's more curated than what you guys share, my yeah. guests share. Um, but I, I facilitate an online support group through the Alzheimer's Association. They are fantastic. There's times when it's like, okay, well, I'll just open the Zoom window and you guys just, you know, help each other. Um, we had a couple of new people today. Um, their loved ones are in earlier stages and there was some questions and I would give my two cents and then let the other people go. And sometimes they got my two cents and that was it. <laughs> Everybody else took over. And that's great because mm -hmm. when you are able to help somebody else, it helps you, you know, it helps validate that, you know, okay, you're doing a good job. You, you, you have something to share it. You know, you have a little bit of a purpose. It's just, you receive as much when you give, you know, I think the saying is, is, you know, like when you reach out with an open hand, you take back more than you give something like that. I don't have it quite yeah. right, but I think the gist is there. And so I, I'm a huge supporter of, of support groups. I attended one throughout most of the pandemic. We started in person, then we were online. Um, I lost my mom at the beginning. Another um, member lost their person um, later that summer. So it sort of turned into a really seriously grief support group more for the other person. And I finally got to the point where like, I can't do this at night. You know, it's like, yeah. you know, it's, it's like, cool. well, she had been resistant to reality, which sounds harsh. I'm just, I'm trying to anonymize it as much as possible. And she wasn't prepared for him to go, which is understandable. We're all kind of like that. And then she was isolated because it was just her at home. She couldn't do, mm -hmm. um, she made, she made clothing. I can't remember if it's for dolls or kids and would sell them at craft fairs. And obviously that was not happening. And so she was really alone in her house. And, you know, this was still at the time when we were kind of hesitant to, you know, like even, you know, we'd like drop off food and then run over to the sidewalk and be like, okay, it's on the mm -hmm. porch. <laughs> Lordy, those yeah. days. We don't need to repeat yeah, my, those days. Um, my mom and dad passed uh, the very beginning of 2020, early spring. And then five months later, my dad passed. So it was one of those, just like you said, bring the groceries, put them in the vestibule, walk out. And I was lucky that right there where you'd go in the front door, my dad was at the second floor window. So we'd bring lawn chairs and stuff and sit there and he'd talk through the open window, but it's, it was horrible. I mean, yeah. let's just say it. It was horrible. So many people that had forms of dementia, a lot of them never 
we're really getting regular visits from loved ones or friends. And it got to the point then where all of them really were not getting any visits except if an aide were able to bring in an iPad or something and they could do a Zoom call or a FaceTime call. So, I mean, talk about us as caregivers feeling isolated a lot of times. It was horrible for the people, you know, suffering, but it had to be worse even for the caregivers to have to just be inundated and taking care of so many people that had no clue what was going on. You know, I mean, well, it's yeah. it was hard. A lot of people in the support group I attended were terrified, uh, rightly so, and lost a lot of their support. You know, like in-home health care workers or caregivers couldn't come in anymore. And they went from, you know, managing to drowning really quick and then feeling guilty because, you know, nobody had answers to anything. And so they just, oh, yeah, yeah, it was just it was really tough. <laughs> and my my goal with my mom was always to give her joy, give her as much quality of life, but not drag out dying from Alzheimer's. So I was I mean. I was blessed. She died March 31st, 2020. So I didn't have to deal with the COVID. I got two weeks of not being able to see her. I got to see her the day before she passed, um, which was also a blessing because I know a lot of people didn't have that. Um, but that, you know, I still feel guilty that I wasn't there. Even I wasn't there for either of my parents. And I've had people tell me, well, if you were meant to be there, you would have been. I'm like, okay, that's, that's nice. Let me see if I could take that to mm -hmm. heart. It's just, it is so hard. We and we, and it's so important that we take care of ourselves almost before we take care of the person we're loving, because the statistic is it used to be well seventy percent of us need care before we die, which doesn't take into account people who die young or die suddenly. Mm -hmm. You know, like a lot of people think, well, I'll be in that thirty percent. Yeah, well, that thirty percent encompasses encompasses a lot of things, and. I think it's 50% of caregivers pass away before their loved one. Yeah, it was and the, 30 and the, something, but I think that's increased. I think you're it right. has. Yeah. yeah. And I, I thought it would have gone down because more no. millennials are caregivers. But if you're over 65, the statistic gets worse. So oh, I'm not, I'm not over 65 yet. Oh, I am. <laughs> um, but that's it's, okay. but that's just, you know, when you sit back and think about that statistic, so yeah, Half of all caregivers, some of whom are late 30s and early 40s, so, you know, pretty prime of life, the stress and the physical exhaustion of caregiving shortens their life. Yeah. Yeah. We need to, we need to rapidly figure out how to not feel well, guilty for taking care of ourselves. Yeah. Because stress just affects everything. Mental, physical, it affects everything. So then it's like, well, then the question is, well, how do I have less stress? Yeah. And of course, the answer is always, you know, delegate the responsibilities. Oh, wonderful. Who's going to pick it up? It always falls back on the, you know, the one person. But it, I found it to be helpful to ask friends and families a lot of times. A lot of times we think people won't help, but if you can... They don't know what they have to help with. You know, it's like, well, can you give me a hand? You know, and it's like, well, what do you need a hand with? Yeah. A my hand brother, doing what? Yeah. My brother would call from Canada and say, Darlene, how can I help you? And it's like, well, you're all the way up in Canada. You can't. You can, you can call. You can talk. Maybe FaceTime. But other than that, you can't. But people that are within driving distance or local, I mean, there's little things people can do. You can ask someone to do something as little as just do some emotional support for the one you're taking care of, whether it is just sitting there and listening to them ask the same question over and over and just, you know, yes, yes, yes. Or, um, you know, showing them pictures in a book or listening or talking with them. And th that's one thing, but you could have someone that maybe they have extra time and they can just do some errands like go pick up medications, go to the dry cleaner, just maybe once a week or 
maybe once a month. I mean, that just gives you a little bit of extra time. Or like in your mom's case, you know, she had her dog. And maybe someone could have gone and just like, I'll just go, you know, a couple times a week and just take the dog out for a walk. I love animals. You know, there's little things like that. If we, I think if we break down what our needs are and just come up with maybe a one or two like little specific things, we can kind of free up a little bit of our time so we can take a breath because we all need to take a breath. Yeah. Which is what I recommend. I learned this from another podcaster whose family, they all, they were unique. They all came together to help take care of grandma. It was like parents, grand, you know, the, the kids, the grandkids, the cousins, they all came together and they formed this care committee. And what they did, and I've, I've translated it a little bit, is, you know, when you realize that your loved one needs care, like at the start of a diagnosis or when you see signs of, you know, like with my mom, we knew what was coming because of my grandmother. Mm -hmm. um, make a list of everything, everybody you know. Make a list of all the things you need to do today to manage the household and yourselves. Make a list of everything you need to do every week, the sporadic things throughout the month. Mm -hmm. And then attach that list to the list of people you know. So like, I'm going to ask Darlene to maybe write some stuff because we know she's good at writing, but we're not going to ask Jen to call insurance companies because the thought of that stresses me the hell out. I hate dealing with those things. I can do it if I absolutely have to, but if you want my help, I'll bring you food. I'll walk the dog. I'll come sit with your person, you know, and then when you, you know, if I say, oh, Darlene, I'm so sorry to hear your dad's struggling. Is there something I can do to help? You have an answer. You don't say, oh, thanks, but you know, I'll let you know. No, you could say, oh, thank God. You know, can you come sit with mom for an hour or two so dad can play some golf? Oh, sure, I could do that. Yeah. You want me to do that a couple times a month? That'd be great. I can do that. I can make that happen. Yeah. You know, you're not, you're not saying, hey, can you call and deal with the bank? I'd be like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I think if we break, like, I think even the whole thing with caregiving, if we can just break it down, a lot of it, really helps us eliminate that stress because I think a lot of us, you feel like you're on that hamster wheel and you're running and getting nowhere and just more and more and more is being thrown your way. And I think we all get to the point where at one point we just throw up our hands and say, dear God, I will never get through this. There is no way I will. And I think, like you said, with that one podcast, I think that's a great thing. I think that's kind of where I was going without even realizing it, is we do. We need to break this huge thing that we're dealing with into smaller parts. And that yep. even means educating ourselves. I mean, we need to really realize that education is so important because I remember as a caregiver, as especially with my mom, I only I did what I knew at the time. And yes, the internet was there. I could look up some things and kind of figure out what I how I should communicate, how I should behave. But then later on, as I educated myself more, I felt guilty about not having done those things earlier. But you know, my brain says, well, you didn't know that earlier, so how could you have done it? But the mm -hmm. heart says, I should have known it. And I think education is so key in taking away some of that caregiver guilt, because the more we know through shows like this, the more we are able to understand what the circumstances are. And it's much easier then for us to make informed decisions as for um, our loved one's best interest, which means once again, we're going to reduce the guilt that is associated with our perception of having shortcomings. So, I mean, it's one of those whole things. We have to break that down. So to recap, we should become as educated as possible, which I agree with. Oh. Get help. We just yeah. talked about how to do that. Um, Give ourselves grace, be proud of the things we managed to do, to take away from the things that we didn't do so well, acknowledge them, make an adjustment where you can. Did I miss anything? I feel like I'm missing oh. something. Oh, 
I think you've covered most of it. Yeah, I think you did. Because you did prioritize self-care. Yeah, we did that. Yeah, I think you got it. If we did just those things, we're going to be phenomenal caregivers. That is very true. So I want to tell you guys really quick about Get in the Boat. Let me show it really quick for the, the YouTube watchers. Um, I was asked to preview this book and give a blurb on what I thought. And I was so excited to read the rest of the book after the blurb. It was painful that I had to wait for it to get printed. <laughs> And I read a lot of caregiver books. So this one really addresses the everyday of a caregiver's life, but not in a depressing, like, why would I want to read this kind of way? Just a really like open, kind of like letting the light in. So I, I, I strongly encourage you guys to read Get in the Boat because I think you'll, you'll recognize yourself in some of Darlene's dad's challenges and maybe learn a little bit from what he was going through. And like we said, educate yourself. And you could do that by reading this great book. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for spending time with me. Well, you're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.